Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a DFS review for the 2021 PGA Championship where Philip Alfred Mickelson is your champion. This is his sixth major championship, his 45th PGA Tour victory, and Phil the Thrill, which it was a thrill today to watch, becomes the oldest champion or victor on the PGA Tour. Of all time. It, it should, I mean, a legend has to have that title, right? And Phil holds it now. So hopefully this stays a very long time. I don't know who is going to beat it. Perhaps maybe the fourth place finisher this week, which was Padraig Harrington. Both of those guys, very similar. They've been, I wouldn't say they're chasing distance, but they're trying to hit the ball further. They are not allowing time to take over their body. And, you know, render them weak or old, you know. Either way, it was awesome. Phil won. Uh, let's get, let's talk about this some more. But I do want to remind you before I actually get further into this. There are timestamps in the description below. If you want to find any part of this video, whatever you find interesting, go ahead and check it out down in the timestamps. But it's also on YouTube's progress bar. So either you're on desktop or mobile you can figure it out by hovering over the progress bar and, and finding timestamps that way. But basically, we're going to recap this video, uh, look at the optimal lineup versus the GPP winning lineup, and then I'm just going to show you guys how well the bucket system did. Um, and and we'll, that's basically what this video is going to be about. But let's go ahead. Let me actually pull up the um, the results. That way, you can have something to stare at while I talk about this. This tournament, uh, I didn't watch a lot of it on Sunday, um, except for at the end. I, I had things going on during the day, so I really wasn't able to watch, but I was paying attention. And at the beginning of the day, if you would have told me that Phil was going to hang on and win this thing, I, I probably would have put 100 bucks on it that he wasn't going to. I thought either Brooks or Louie was gonna, going to win this one, and I, I really thought Louie was going to pull away. I just had a feeling. you know, It was a gut feeling. But I was wrong. Phil held on, won this thing. It didn't look like he wavered at all. I believe he had a five-shot uh, lead at one point in time during the tournament. I saw he was minus eight, and the next guy was minus three. Uh, so, like, it was – Phil was in the driver's seat the pretty much the entire day. And, it, I mean, again, I, it's hard to comprehend, but a, a 50-year-old, we really haven't – I shouldn't say we haven't – sniffed an older an elder statesman winning this tournament davis love the third has came close um i believe vj has came close but to see phil do it on a major champion uh, or in a major championship it's awesome you know phil will always be i shouldn't say always but for a while he's going to be known as the oldest uh pga champion or PJ Victor, or whatever you want to call it, on tour in all history, uh, until the next person breaks it. Which, you know, who when you when you think about it, who who in the current game do we anticipate, you know, being the next Phil? You know, Phil has been known for having a very long, elastic golf swing. And a lot of people think that leads to injury, but some other people go, that's how you avoid injury. And like who do we have in the game now that that we could see supplant that that uh that record perhaps it's tiger woods if he ever comes back you know and if he does come back he comes back at uh the level you know before he left basically who knows obviously he has all of his injury concerns but perhaps it's him perhaps it's phil again maybe phil wins another tournament in the next you know, five years. It's totally po possible, right? If we think about Phil uh, being able to compete on tour, he's still hitting the ball just as far as everybody. I think even today, hole 16, he hit 366-yard drive, and Brooks hit it 361. He's out driving Brooks. It's it's remarkable. Like, Phil is such a likable guy, and, and for him to, you know, keep up this pace is, is awesome. Yeah, he had some issues with focusing during a during a tournament, which is weird for a you know a consummate pro, a savvy veteran like himself. But perhaps it isn't. You know, while we golf, our mind can go places really quickly, very easily. And if he's not in it to win it, 
yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to focus. So, I mean, give him the pass. He has a very good career, you know, uh, behind him, in front of him pro- still probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to, to roster someone like Phil when he makes comments like that. But at the very same sense, like, he still has all the talent that you should consider when owning him. Which leads me to my performance in DFS this week. I accidentally owned 0% of Phil Mickelson. And that, again, that was by accident. I also owned 0% of Brooks Kepka, Again, by accident. Here's the, here's the accident, how it happened. I had built 75 lineups with kind of the cascading you know method where you just pick a core of golfers and you just you know replace one of them every you know every lineup going down i included because i built like 75 lineups that way uh i had the optimizer run and give me 100 lineups and then i copied those lineups over put them on a different sheet and then i ran 100 more so i did like 275 lineups and what I ended up doing from there is I randomized, you know, I put a formula in right next to all of them with, with a random function and randomized, I, I, I randomized it a bunch of times. And then I just took the f- top 112 lineups because I only created a hundred or I was only in 112 contests this week. Uh, and I put all those lineups in those 112. I did put exposure to Mickelson and I also put minimum exposure to him. I think it was the minimum was 2%. Um, so I know I had Phil in some of my lineups for the 250 lineups, but when I randomized it, he did not show up in the top 112. So that's why I had 0% of him. And that's why I had 0% of Brooks. I'm not going to make that mistake going forward. Uh, I, I don't know why I let fate decide what my lineups were going to be like. I did like spot check some golfers. The, the main ones like Sam Burns was one of them. I really wanted Sam Burns in my lineup. Uh, Thankfully, I didn't go 100% on him like I tweeted out and ended up owning him in 30%. So, you know, when he withdrew on Thursday, 30% of my lineups were already dead. When you have 0% Brooks or yeah, 0% Brooks and 0% Phil, you're not going to have a good week. But thankfully, uh, I figured out the showdown method this week. It, I did a poor job in the preview explaining how this golf course layout was. Uh, I said the front nine goes out one direction and the back nine comes in a different direction. That's That was false. The front nine went out one direction for four, four holes, turned around and came back to close out that front nine. But then the back nine went and continued that direction and then turned around after four or five holes and came in, you know, to the clubhouse. So if you think about like a a, a bow tie, basically where the middle of that bow tie is the clubhouse. Think of the front nine going out and coming back in and the back nine going out and coming back in that created eight holes all in one direction from holes six, all the way to holes 14 or not holes, but hole 14. So those eight holes all in the same direction, meaning the wind, wherever the wind was, that was going to affect that stretch of holes, you know, equally. And we found out it was an east wind. Well, holes six through eight or six through fourteen went eastward. They went from west to east. No, they went from east to west. I'm sorry. The wind was coming in from the east. So that was blowing east to west. That means all of those holes were downwind. If you think anything about, you know, um, uh, like streaks or anything like that, like birdie streaks or whatever, it's best to have multiple holes in a row to get those streaks. So I had targeted everybody on Thursday and Friday showdown slates who started on hole one. And for Thursday, I focused more on the the guys uh, that were in the morning. They ended up being your better golfers. So I won 50 bucks on Thursday in a contest because I, I implored that method. And I really should have tweeted about it, but the little bit of superstition in me is I didn't want anyone else to know about it. Although I'm sure I wasn't going against anybody uh, in any of those contests. I, I also deployed it on Friday to no success. 
Uh, I don't even think I sniffed half, you know, the, the middle mark in that contest. But that $50, what it did was it covered my week because I only put 50 bucks in. I ended up putting in 63 at the end of it and came back with 58. So I lost five bucks. Um, but yeah, I, it was good. It was a good week. It was fun. Obviously that Thursday I won, but yeah, the overall process was, was not good on my end. And it had everything to do with lineup building, not so much the process, which we'll get into soon. Sorry. It's been 10 minutes and I've just been talking about, uh, my performance and, uh, Phil winning the tournament, but you can see everyone on inside the top 10. Uh, you can see there are 16 total golfers that finished inside the top 10. So obviously when we talk about the bucket system, you can already kind of conclude everything hit because how many guys were inside the top 10. Uh, we'll still go over it and not everything hit, but I'll, I'll definitely cover that. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, Millie Maker winning lineup versus the optimal lineup. So I played one, one uh, lineup inside the Millie Maker did not cash. Uh, Xander ended up missing the cut for me. And shoot, I can't remember. But I just barely missed the cut with the, the two guys that I had. And unfortunately, with four guys, hard to cash. Not impossible. But again, when you have 0% Brooks and 0% Phil, un, you just can't do that. Um, so I actually have three lineups we're going to cover. I include the realistic lineup. And I put it in a color coding so you guys can see it. But first of all, the, the Millie Maker winning lineup... Scored 501.5 points. It used up all 50,000. This is like almost, well, we've had 30 tournaments this season so far. This is like 20, the 25th tournament out of 30 where $50,000 is taken down the GPP using all 50,000. All those people in the industry that tell you to leave money off the table or leave money on the table because that's the only way to diversify your lineups. This guy won million dollars on his own using all fifty thousand dollars of salary and and i i should give you the numbers you know like the exact numbers but it is the majority of gpp winning lineups use all fifty thousand dollars so you know it's bad advice to give you to diversify your lineups anyways fifty thousand million maker winning lineup it included your the top three guys phil brooks and louis ustazen then it went down to Justin Rose in 8th place, Sung J.M. in 17th place, and Hideki Matsuyama, who was in 23rd place. Not terrible. Four guys inside the top 10. We want to get all six of our, our, our guys inside the top 10. And the optimal lineup did just that and only used 46,300. Optimal lineup scored 529. So there was only a 28 point, sorry, a 28 point difference between those two. That lineup has all of these golfers with the top right corner with that little black tick mark. Uh, Mickelson, Kepka, Ustazen, Podrick Harrington, Paul Casey, and Justin Rose. It used 46,300. Now, if you've been with me for a while, you know this is unobtainable. There's no way if I tell you, hey, you want to leave $3,000 on the table, you want to know how many more lineups that will allow you to build? It just, the the combinations of lineups become endless. When we can get our lineups closer to $50,000, we will actually narrow more of our lineups because you basically bring that average threshold up. And I'll show you. Uh, let me go ahead and bring this up. I'm already going to give you some of the answers away. But let's do something like this. Um, I'm going to use, you know, I'm going to build lineups right here to show you what, what it is. So if we wanted to use like 40 set, uh, let's grab these guys right here. Uh, let's see, there's set seven guys. So here's six. Let's see what it equals up to. So 8,400 all the way across. I think this is gonna be really close to, yeah, so this uses up 49,000 right here. So that's at 8,400 uses up 49,000. Well, if we come down to, let's say, we'll grab 78, down to 76, paste that across. There's $3,800 on the table. So this is very similar. So if you think about it this way, basically if you wanted to put six golfers together near the same price, you start at 7,800 and you can then build lineups from there down. You know, the thing with that though is 
if you wanted to create a forty nine thousand uh, dollar lineup, that's the difference. Is is the six hundred that I just showed you? And this was kind of a blind shot. Like I actually didn't have the prices. I was going to figure it out with you guys. But that's the difference of starting at eighty four hundred versus starting at seventy eight hundred. So basically, you can't put together these six golfers that I just highlighted. Uh, over here, who was it? All the way to Corey Connors. You can't put those six golfers together when trying to come up with the realistic optimal lineup because we're looking at lineups that are $49,000 or more. So with that realistic lineup, you can't do this going down. And, you know, honestly, you can't even go 81. You have to start at 84. So you can see just between these, these golfers here, well, how many do we have? Nine in total. The combinations from there, I mean, I, I, I'm not a probability expert. I, I don't know how to, you know, put this. But basically, you would be multiplying those nine golfers with everybody underneath them to give you that many more. Uh, not, not that many more. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be the difference. The, 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 oh, shoot, how am I trying to say this? Um. Basically, you're removing the the combinations by starting at 8,400 with anyone that you were to start with underneath them. I think that's how I'm trying to say this. Not not positive exactly, but um, I just know there are thousands more lineups you can create if you were to leave money on the table. So that's all I'm trying to get at. I hope that wasn't too confusing, but just take my word for it. There are less lineups you can create the closer you get to $50,000 than you can going below it, you know, if you're trying to leave more money on the table. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Um, so anyways, my realistic lineup is any lineup over $49,000, putting in six golfers that are $49,000 or more. And you just saw, this was a perfect example. If we're leaving $1,000 on the table, as you can see, remaining salary, uh, we're leaving the a thousand. That means we're starting at forty nine thousand, and that obviously starts with Matt Fitzpatrick at eighty four hundred dollars. So we are trying to get lineups over forty nine thousand, and our realistic lineup this week did include a six K golfer, but then it, I mean it's everything here in green. It included well Brooks and Louis, so those three guys. Then Justin Rose, Will Zalatoris, and Matt Fitzpatrick. Now a optimal lineup i want all six golfers inside the uh inside the top 10 we can easily do that by switching up matt fitzpatrick who scored 75 points with scotty scheffler who scored 72 points there that way we have all six golfers inside the top 10 but we can skip that it's not that big of a deal that realistic lineup used up forty nine thousand five hundred. if we were to put scheffler here you just add a hundred dollars to it so it'd be forty nine thousand six. They scored, that lineup scored 523. And again, if you put Scheffler in there instead of Fitzpatrick, it would score 520. Still beats the Millie Maker, and that's what we're looking for. We're trying to find the best scoring lineup over $49,000 that still beats the GPP. That's our realistic optimal lineup. So again, that week, or this week, it was Phil, Brooks, Louie, Justin Rose, Will Zalatoris, and Matt Fitzpatrick. But again, you can replace Fitzpatrick with Scheffler, it really doesn't matter to me, but I want all six of my guys inside the top 10. So I would replace Fitzpatrick with Scheffler. So there you have it. That is your difference between the optimal lineup, the Millie Maker lineup, and the realistic optimal lineup. Um, let's see. Can we do that with all the buckets that we talked about? So if we go and we look here, we actually kind of have to start. I mean, we're going we're gonna to talk about this. But before we actually get in to see if we can create an optimal lineup based off the buckets, what did we actually, what were we looking for? Uh, and if you recall, if I go to this lineup construction page, most of you guys already saw this anyways, but we're looking at tournament history bucket ones, recent form bucket twos, last year bucket ones, and last year bucket fours. And we had a reason why we did that. When we looked at our summary, that has all the buckets with the projected uh, amounts that we should see golfers in these buckets show up inside the top 10, their success rates, that kind of thing. Those were the four buckets that had the highest success rate, the, the smallest amount of golfers in that bucket, uh, which made it easier to select from. 
and with the projected amount over one, basically. So that's how we, we ended up choosing it. Now, I already did kind of the legwork for you guys. I, I highlighted all the golfers from these buckets that finished inside the top 10. That's what I ended up doing. So you can see just about every bucket has at least two uh, that we chose from. And it was just, you have to pick the right golfers. I didn't really give you my favorites. I mean, I kind of did, but not really uh, as to who I thought was going to do well. Uh, Louis Oosthuizen showed up quite a bit. I liked Louis a lot, so I played a lot of Louis. But for the rest of the guys that are highlighted, I mean, Paul Casey was chosen by my optimizer quite a bit, so I did play quite a bit of Paul Casey. I also played a little bit of John Rahm, but I didn't play much of Brooks. I didn't play much of Rose. Uh, I did play a considerable amount of Scheffler and Finau, but for me, the go golfers that I chose out of these buckets mostly were Rory and JT. Um, Victor Hovland and Webb were big ones for me. And obviously Sam Burns over here. Those were all big golfers, but I can also look here. Victor, Xander. I did play Jordan, so I played those guys. I, I basically played all the wrong guys. But the golfers we wanted were here. And if if I'm being honest and I'm criticizing, if I'm being fair with you know criticizing myself, these the the amount of golfers in these buckets are still too much. You know, it's it's there are too many golfers to choose from. Uh, the combinations of lineups you can create just by starting with these guys are still way too plentiful. Like we couldn't even create a hundred lineups that wouldn't even be close enough to get all the different combinations of golfers together um, without duplicating each other. So I don't know how we narrow this down. I'm not really looking to narrow it down. I just know we're grabbing golfers from these buckets. Um, and unfortunately, do we know which, which ones that we want to choose from? I will actually mention this. Uh, if we were to actually go back to the 2021 DK page, if you recall, what I did is I, I, I filtered down all the way with my favorite buckets between four and four and one. Um, you know, I, I, I just selected everything that was four and one. We had these five golfers and I even told you guys just because they are, you know, tops in, in each of, or they're in the preferred buckets doesn't mean that they're going to have success. It just means they have a better chance at success. Well, out of these five golfers we talked about in the preview video, Louis Oosthuizen showed up inside the top 10. I mean, he was $8,000. Now, personally, my favorite guy was Xander. Uh, I actually liked almost everybody up other than Louis uh, in this bucket. But I think, you know, if I were to do this over again, I would just do like 20% of each of these guys. Maybe I'd mix and match some of them where I would leave, you know, maybe 10% of my lineups not having any of these guys. Or maybe I just own them a little bit more and have them in 100% of my lineups, at least one of these guys, um, just in case it hits. But there, there was no certainty that it was going to, like I said, it just gave them a better chance of finishing inside the top 10. And I know buckets don't propel golfers to do better. It's just when we analyze the top 10 and put these guys into, into buckets, these were the favorable buckets. So it was kind of a no-brainer one of these guys was going to do well. Just wasn't sure which one. So anyways, that is something that we ended up doing. Uh, we did talk about those golfers. Um, I know some of you guys reached out to me and like, well, this makes me like so-and-so just a little bit more, which, hey. You know, one of you guys said it was Louie, and if we would have stuck to that, we probably would have done a little bit better uh, in our DFS lineups. But outside of those four buckets to choose from, what I ended up doing was I looked at all these projected amounts, and I highlighted it green if it hit. I highlighted it red if it didn't. As you can see, only two buckets did not hit. Now, how does how do I calculate if they hit or not? I don't mind the uh, the decimal point. Now, obviously, if I get rid of this decimal point, there, it's going to round up. What I end up doing is I round down for each of these because half of a golfer to me doesn't really matter that much. And I mean, if it's like, you know, three fourths of a golfer or even 0.9 of a golfer, I might toy around with the idea of going up and just say, okay, instead of three, it's four. But here's how I do this. So it, I, I should say this. 
it's green if that number on the left, you know, the one before the decimal point, uh, if that number matched how many were in the uh, that were inside the top ten, or if the if 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 the amount or hold on, the golfers in these buckets. If there were more golfers or or the same number that we have on the left of the decimal point inside the top 10, I highlighted it green. So if we look last year ones, I think this is a perfect example. If I go to last year ones and let's first of all, look only at the top 10 and basically count how many last year ones did we have you can see there were six. So bad example. Let me see if I can remember one off the top of my head. I don't think I can. Um, last year fours. I think we had just two last year fours, if I'm correct. One, two. Yeah. So here's a good example. We only had two last year fours. They end up being in the optimal lineups. Looking at the summary, it says 2.22, meaning it was more than two. So if it was, if, we only had two or more that finished inside the top 10. I highlighted this bucket. So that's what I did with all of them. And again, as you can see, only two didn't make it. But if we were to go to this recent form two, it really wasn't terrible. Uh, it was one of those buckets that we were choosing from. We only had two golfers instead of um, the four that it shows here, 4.29. We did have a minimum of one. So if I were to tell you we wanted to see at least, or we wanted to own at least one golfer that was in this bucket, I wouldn't have been wrong. Uh, I keep going to that, that other tab, I'm sorry. And in fact, one of them was in the optimal lineup. He was in all of the optimal lineups. Well, not all, the realistic optimal lineup and the true optimal lineup. So yeah. If I told you you wanted to definitely play a golfer from that, okay, I'm just going to close. I, I don't know why I keep doing that. Uh, you wanted a golfer within that bucket, we wouldn't have been wrong. Um, here's what I do. Uh, I make sure that when I put my conditionals in my optimizer, I will look at this number. And what I end up doing is I minus this number well, this number from this number. So two minus 3.56 or 3.56 minus two equals uh, 1.56. But I don't include that five, six, it's just one. So for me, tells me I should play at least one of these guys. That's how I look at it. And I didn't, I didn't really go over that during the strategy video, but that's how I look at it. If it's a zero, it put it this way. If any of these numbers are zero, that means the bucket's too volatile for me. We've we've seen at least zero any given year. That's not okay. Like I'm looking only if this number is one or greater. And when it's minus into that number, does it equal one or more? That's how I look to make sure it's a lock bucket. If that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, if it's zero, I don't ever go with that. So if we were to look, what what were our locked buckets? We obviously saw last year ones were. If we look at all these, let's go down to the next one. One into 1.99, that equals 0.99. And I know that's 0 0.01 away from one. It doesn't count for me. It's not a one. But if we were to look at last year three, is do we see anyone inside the top three? I did it again. Uh, any that were last year threes? Yeah, uh, Ricky Fowler was a last year three. So we did see at least one. I mean, we saw exactly one. So yeah, that bucket would have worked uh, if we were to take a look. So last year three, that was a one. Yeah, 0 0.99, I wouldn't have said, yes, we need to play one, but it worked out. It was close enough. How about the next one? The did not plays from last year. It says minimum of one when we minus 2.29, when we minus this one into 2.29, we get 1.29. So it means we should see one. And we actually see three inside the top 10. So that was another bucket that just, this should have been a lock. Should have incorporated that. And I should have added it to this right here. I only have last year ones and last year fours. So thinking about that in retrospect, yeah, should have done that. 
you know, I don't know why I went with this last year for, I think it was just because the projected amount was 2.22 and the success rate was over 10%. In retrospect, I should have included this one because I think it would have got me to, well, let's see here. Um, I mean, Patty Harrington was inside the top 10. I, I'm not playing anyone that's under 6,500, so I would never have gotten there. But Will Zalatoris was that guy. That could have got me on Will even more. I, I liked Will. He was in a good um, in a good uh, pairing, tea time pairing. Yeah, in re- in retrospect, you know, or in hindsight, it just it, it stings. It sucks. So last year twos, that was perfect. Coming down here now, this number for last week one was actually uh, lower than the minimum. So for me, what that would say is I can't trust two being the number we want. I can trust one to be that number though. So I would have pegged this down one uh, and and say, okay, it's a lock for one of these guys. If we take a look, open this up, you can already see Will Zalatoris was that guy. When we look at ones, it's only Will Zalatoris. So again, it would have given me a good reason to play Will Zalatoris and it probably would have just been Will Zalatoris uh, for both of those buckets. It would have just highlighted, hey, play this guy. Uh, obviously, I'm only looking at inside the top 10. If I guess I open it up to everybody, let's see what that would have looked like. I mean, there's a bunch of ones, right? Yeah. Not a bunch, actually. Only eight. Is that correct? Yep, only eight. Okay. So, I mean, it was right in front of me. Should have figured that one out. Actually, let me see. Hold on. Was he the only last year two of that group? Him, Sam Burns. So I liked Sam Burns. Uh, and KH Lee. Okay. Let's take a look even further here. Uh, this one would have equaled zero. I wouldn't have trusted the last week three. I can tell you John Rahm is the only guy that actually um, qualifies for all guys inside the top ten of last last week threes. So John Rom finished there. I, I still would have said zero. You you shouldn't have felt comfortable playing that. Uh, going down here, we have a bunch of zeros. So the first one that we stop at is tournament history ones. And the, the projected amount was 4.86. The minimum was one. So to me, we want to play at least three. That ended up hitting. You know, if we're looking at tournament history ones, here were all your guys. We had three guys that were inside the optimal lineup, but we had six guys total. So that bucket hit, there was no problem with that one. And it, again, you want three, how many actual, actually, hold on. We can obviously look at this. So if this one hits, we only had 25 golfers to choose from. If I were to say you wanted to play at least three of them, it makes lineup building a little easier because you're choosing three out of that 25 and then you're filling in the other three with other other reasons. So unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, I really didn't go down that route. I, I I guess I I mean I should have, but I, I'm kind of skeptical like I'm I'm scared to go that much in, if I'm being honest, to say, all right, let's lock in three golfers that are in this bucket. When I shouldn't. I've been doing this bucket system forever, uh, and it, it rarely is wrong. Looking at tournament history twos, again, one into three point six four, one minus not minus, it's three point six four minus one. Uh that means we want two. We want at least two guys that are tournament history bucket twos. When we look at this, we have three with Phil Mickelson being your winner. Now, this kind of burns me a little bit because um, I really didn't look at this bucket, if I'm being quite honest with you. I wasn't... Actually, that's a lie, right? No, it was ones. I was really more focused on uh, tournament history bucket ones. Not three of them, though, but, you know, I, I didn't put a lock in to find, you know, a guy that was a last or a tournament history bucket, too. So as I look at this, we don't, well, we had 42 in the field. So it would have been hard to kind of, you know, pull the correct golfer from there. But again, I mean, that one hits. And I, I'm not going to go through all the other ones. You can take my word. Obviously, we, we've already went through a bunch and I've showed you that they actually turn out. Now these zeros, 0 
you can round up to one, but I don't, right? So zero, did we see any? Um, I mean, if we didn't see one, it would equal green. You know, if we saw one, you know, for this one, it still equals green. As long as the number is zero or more, which is cheating. But, you know, I it's just a bucket to say, hey, there's a possibility. At 0.48, there's a possibility, but it's not likely. Uh, I guess what I should do is if we saw like six guys in one of these buckets to actually say, okay, well, I said there was a chance, but the majority of the bucket actually did finish inside the top 10. I, I, but I'll say this. I went through all of these. I didn't see that that instance. So you can uh, be comforted in into knowing that although it's green, it wasn't crazy. You know, maybe we saw one, maybe we saw two, but more likely we saw zero. Uh, but yeah, the only buckets that didn't were strokes game bucket twos and uh, recent form bucket twos. And if I were to go and look, let me just open this all to everything. So strokes gain bucket two golfers. You know, this is your top 10 right here. If we were to look at our strokes gain bucket twos, we see a couple of them one shot away from finishing inside the top 10. So not terrible. In fact, Sungjae was in your winning lineup. And Matt Fitzpatrick was in your, oh no, no, he was a strokes game one. So here's one thing to, to bring up. I will highlight all the buckets that have negative putting. Now, a lot of people were talking about how negative putters are just all types of, well, actually that this type of golf course was going to bring in you know, is going to make things equal for all types of putters, whether they're negative or positive or whatever. It, it was going to boost bad putters. This doesn't, seeing this, yeah, sure, there are, the majority of golfers inside the top 10 have negative putting stats, but usually your strokes game bucket three guys are a shoe in to finish inside the top 10. Not all of them, but it's it's a very good bucket to finish inside the top 10. It's got positive off the tee. If I get rid of those guys and we're only stuck with really the negative off the tee and negative putting guys, we only see two. Um, but we usually see a lot of threes. Last week, I think four or five of our guys inside the top 10 were strokes in bucket three guys. But we didn't hear anything about bad putters doing well at the at t Byron Nelson. And I think even the week before that at Wells Fargo, the same thing occurred. Like, strokes game bucket one or two, they're kind of one and the same, but strokes game bucket two has either a negative stat uh, for approach or around the green. So, you know, ones and twos are almost, they're very similar. It's positive putting and positive off the tee. So, obviously, we see a bunch of ones, right? Fours are positive putting negative off the tee. And, of course, you'd know this if you were watching the strategy video. In case you didn't, then, obviously, there's a reminder or there's a... You, that's how I do things. Um, it's still a good chunk, meaning in order to get the optimal lineup, you still have to put in bad putters with good putters. There is no choose one or the other. You know, if I were to look at, I guess, everybody who missed the cut and were to take a look, how many, okay, so we have a total of 71 golfers who missed the cut. How many of them were positive putters? Only 20 out of, out of the 72 that missed the cut. I know you can't see this. There's a, a calculation that's happening right underneath me, but I can scroll. This is all the way to the bottom. So it's just those guys. Strokes game bucket ones, twos, and fours are positive putters. If I were to look at three and fives, how many do we have there? So less, okay. So we have 14 guys. That means our sixes take up the majority. So guys that do not have any strokes gain stats. So here are all your club pros and then some of our uh, European golfers. Perhaps we should look at all those that made the cut uh, and take a look at ones twos and fours actually how many do we have in 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 total we had 80 80 exact golfers 81 golfers okay so we had 81 
Take a look at all of our positive putters. 42, so it was almost half. I don't know what that actually relates to on other tournaments. Like, I can't compare what that looks like to other tournaments. Hopefully, whenever we get this website and database up and running, we can we can take looks or we can look at that kind of stuff. Uh, but what my whole purpose here is, it doesn't matter. Like, there are four types of putters. And three of them you could consider bad putters. You know, again, I always, it's, it's the matrix. Um, you have good putters that can read putts well. You have good putters that can't read putts. You have bad putters that can read putts. And then you have, I shouldn't say bad putters. It's, it's technique. So replace all those goods. And, so good, good technique, good reading, good technique, bad reading, bad technique, good reading, and bad technique, bad reading. So those are your four types of putters and your bad bads are usually the ones you want to stay away from the two that are in between, you know, that have good and bad. Those are your streaky putters, but your good goods are the ones that you kind of want to stay around. I don't have a metric to determine who your good, good putters are. Um, but those are your four types of putters and that's how it goes just in life in general when it comes to golf. So to me, all that this really did was maybe provided guys who can't read putts well but have good technique a little bit leg up than those that have good technique or that have bad technique but can read putts well. Because I think those guys just still stay pretty poor. You know, they still have bad technique. Um, so I think that's the only benefit. And I couldn't tell you who those golfers are off the top of my head. I haven't figured out you know, how to analyze that kind of stuff. It would have to take me looking at people's putting to determine that kind of thing. Um, much like it would be like shot shape. You know, you have to just watch everybody, you know, hitting a golf ball to see what, what happens when they, when they do. Uh, I, but we can use putting stats and, and I think we know that there probably are ways to do it with looking at stats, but either way, my whole my whole point of all of this was you still needed a good mix of good putters and bad putters. You know, if you open yourself up to owning more bad putters than good putters, you probably didn't do that great. Uh, you still could have you still could have created a, a lineup that had a lot of top tens, but yeah, that whole bad putting thing just did not make any sense to me whatsoever. Like how these greens opened it up for bad putters just didn't make sense to me. Uh, anyways, moving on, what other things can we look at? Well, I only want to look at the top 10. So let's, again, clear all of this and just look at the golfers inside the top 10. Sweet spot rank. Uh, we had two guys down here that were 100 or more. Both of them finished fourth. So that's kind of a bummer. Uh, what I want to see is most of the sweet spot scores being inside the top 10 or top 20. Whoa, 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 whoa. What am I trying to say? I want to see the guys inside the top 10 have a score under 100 especially in a 150 man field like that's that would be success to me that means the the sweet spot score that i'm using isn't terrible like it can get me to the winners it's just you know how do we get that uh it, it's putting the the right lineups together so it's it's like excluding golfers outside 100 but as you can see actually you know what it's really not terrible only four of our guys inside, you know, four out of 16 guys that finished inside the top 10 uh, were 75 or greater. Now, two of them ended up being the optimal lineup. One of them won the tournament. Uh, Padraig was not in the realistic lineup, so we don't have to really worry about that. But Phil being 95th, how do we get to Phil when he's 95 in the sweet spot score? So, I mean... That score needs to be updated. Uh, I want to create some kind of potential, fantasy potential, uh, that will boost you know golfers that have bad scores a little bit, like like Phil. Obviously, we all know his potential. Uh, if we were to you know compare him to somebody else in the six K range, I'm just gonna go to this page first and and look at the golfers down here. You know, Phil was 6,700 right here. Uh, when we compare Phil to, let's say, somebody else who finished even inside the top 10, like a Kevin Streelman, do we think Kevin Streelman's better than Phil? Probably not. You know, when we look at a lot of these guys, 
we know Rasmus Ho- Hoygaard is a good European golfer, but he has yet to prove anything on the PGA Tour. Do we think of him as a better golfer than Phil? There's a time, or there might be a time he will be. But right now, no, of course not. Uh, the same goes with all of these guys in the 6K range. I mean, Carlos Ortiz, to me, I think is better than Phil currently. There's, you know, Ryan Palmer is probably really close to Phil. You know, I would put them together pretty close. Stuart Sink, I think, is the exact same type of golfer right now as Phil. Stu has won twice on tour um, this year. So, yeah, I would put I put uh, Stu Sink up there. Cameron Davis has potential, but is he better than Phil? I don't think right now he is. He isn't. Um, when I scroll through these guys, I, I don't see anyone that I truly believe is better than Phil. There are, there are golfers, don't get me wrong, that I think have the potential at any given tournament to to play better than Phil. You know, Taylor Gooch, Sebastian Munoz, those are golfers here that I do think. But I mean, if we're, I'm not doing this with hindsight bias. I, I'm literally looking and, and comparing these guys as they are today. Who's better than Phil in the 6K range? $6,500 and up. That's the the only price that I'm I really care about. All right, let me scroll over a little bit. So you guys can see this better. Um, maybe Brennan Steele, perhaps. You know, he he would be on that short list. There's a lot of guys that have potential to be better than Phil. But even Phil's potential, his maximum potential. Let, let's let's look at it that way. His maximum potential. I don't think anyone touches you know touches him. I've seen Sebastian Munoz go low in a round, but I haven't seen him put, you know, together four good rounds of golf. Uh, I mean, the same could go with to say about Phil, but still Phil has shown some brilliance this year, although he has bad, you know, finishing or finishing positions, but I don't know, man. Like I I'm truly being as honest as I possibly can. When I look at some of these guys now, I know I can tell you this right now. Here are the golfers that I was owning over Phil before the, the start of the tournament. It was Stu Sink. It was Carlos Ortiz. Ryan Palmer. Uh, it was just those three guys that I liked more than Phil. I sprinkled in some Cam Davis. I did like Cam Davis. Um, and, and, and Brennan Steele. He was the only other guy that I really picked over oh i'm sorry sebastian munoz and taylor gooch i sprinkled in so the first three golfers that i t- i told you about ortiz sink and palmer those were the guys i owned more than i did phil no matter what like i was always going to choose those three guys over phil the rest of the guys that i t- I, I highlighted those were the same sprinkles that i would have done uh with phil you know the same ownerships that i've done with phil so yeah, but before the uh, beginning of the tournament, I would have said those three before Phil. Looking, I guess, in hindsight, though, looking at potential, and if, if that's all we're going to weigh the 6K range as or compare the 6K K range as, I think you have to go with potential. Even, even if, say, a Ryan Palmer has exceeded his value in plenty of tournaments or a Carlos Ortiz you know, obviously won this year at the the Houston Open. Despite those guys having their better finishes, I still think Phil, with his max, considering max potential, I think he's better than these these golfers. Um, it's just that he is volatile. He's very volatile, but that's what you want, especially for golfers in the six k range. So in hindsight, it's a bummer that I didn't think of playing more Phil. Um, actually, let me see what did I have him marked for maximum exposure. Uh, I am taking a look here at the optimizer. I can scroll in just a little bit. We are looking here. My max exposure was 7%. And I had 2% minimum ownership. So, um, unfortunately, again, with how I built lineups, it it excluded them because obviously I created 250 lineups. And I'll tell you right now, the, those cascading lineups I created, I did not uh, include... Uh, Phil Mickelson in whatsoever, but yeah, again, thinking about that 6k range, I don't know if there's anyone that has better potential than Phil, and I I wish I would have thought of that 
before creating lineups. I'm still okay with the guys I picked. You know, uh, Stuart Sink, no problem with that. Had no problem with um, Cam Davis, Ryan Palmer, or Carlos Ortiz. But unfortunately, they did not play that well. Uh, they obviously didn't finish inside the top 10. So it's a, it's a bummer. Um, Let's see here. Let's look at the top 20 stats of each, or the top 20 golfers in each stat. Just so you guys, you know, I, I like doing this because I can t- tell you guys and show you with proof that selecting one golf or selecting a golfer based off of whether or not they have good off the tee or or what isn't quite the way to go. Uh, so let's take a look here. I usually start with grass stats, but you know I had Pete Dye stats and that was it. Oh, let me actually hold on. So I usually look at Pete, you know, grass stats as um, an indicator to success. And I will usually look at this top 10 percentage. So this is how frequently do they finish inside the top 10? Like at the, what, what percentage do they finish inside the top 10 at this type of golf course? So this was a Pete Dye golf course. I did not have Seashore Pass Palum uh, stats. I always select golfers who are 5% or more. Or I shouldn't say I always select golfers. I don't choose golfers below 5% top 10 frequency. Uh, And we can see two, Harry Higgs and Padraig Harrington. Outside of that, look at how many guys are 20% or more. I mean, Phil 5.56%, not the greatest, but all the other golfers underneath them. Oh man, it's, I wonder how easy it would have been to get there. Let's let's, uh, sort from top to bottom. These are your top 20 golfers in the field for the stat and really we only have Paul Casey and Justin Rose who are in our optimal lineups Uh, and Justin Rose was in the uh, realistic lineup so only one guy if we were looking at the top guys here so when we look at those type of stats that didn't work out for us looking at our top overall Pete Dye golfers though we have one two and three inside the top 20 for that stat so that one not terrible we got three uh, but we do have a lot of missed cuts as well. So we always look at it this way. I'm looking at all the top 10 finishes. We had five in total. We also had six missed cuts. So it's very even. So it's it's not like we can really tell success off of that. Scrolling down a little bit, we go to season long stats. Let's look at off the tee stats. How many off the tee top 10s do we have versus missed cuts? I'll say this. We only had three... Well, actually two missed cuts. Bubba did not miss the cut. He just finished 80th, which was almost dead last. We only had two guys missing the cut for off the tee for this tournament. Uh, If we were to look at this, probably wouldn't have taken down a GPP, but you might have cashed in a cash lineup. You know, inside the top 20, we had uh, two guys in the realistic optimal lineup and really Brooks being in the optimal lineup. So off the tee, not terrible. I mean, it didn't really lead you to a GPP winning lineup, but... It had more, it had only three missed cuts. So that's, that's a good thing. Approach. Ooh, here's a good one. Okay. So I will, I will, um, what's the word? Surrender to the fact that we had a ton of top tens inside or not top tens, but we had more success with approach stats this week than, than I would have given, um, credit for so we have two missed cuts and a withdraw versus one, two, three, four, five top tens. And then we can add six, seven, eight top twenties. So eight top twenties, two missed cuts and a withdraw approach was a good one to go with. I think you would have done pretty decent. I mean, we had one realistic lineup, one true optimal lineup, uh, and then one that was in the Millie maker. So uh yeah optimal lineup you couldn't have gotten there but this would have been a good one to you know win some cash games with so yeah that was good around the green way more missed cuts than top 10s or top 20s uh we can just skip past that and putting i mean louis your top putter in the field finished second we also had brooks up there as well finishing second uh, but yeah putting was not uh, a stat to look for so yeah approaching off the tee I would, I mean, I never really look at approach. 
the way that most of the people in the industry do, because usually with optimal lineups, you're not going to get all six guys with good approach. But if you wanted to make some money, you could have cashed with a cash lineup. You wouldn't have won a GPP going this route, though. I mean, you had 20 golfers to select from. Is Paul Casey your top guy? Probably not. Will Zalatoris, though, maybe. You know, with a realistic lineup, it's possible. So I'm not going to give credit and say, yeah, you want to choose approach guys. But yeah, we see a lot of success here and very little failure. So that works out. Uh, I don't really have anything else to talk about when it comes to stats. I kind of want to see what the best bogey avoidance golfers are. That wasn't a good one. Birdie or better? No, that really wasn't good. How about good drive percentage? Nope. Driving accuracy? Driving distance? Not really. Actually, driving distance had a lot of guys here. Let's see. The top 38 golfers, we have four that were in the optimal lineup when it came to driving distance. And by the way, do you see that? Patty Harrington and Phil Mickelson. So what I said at the beginning of this video, that these are two guys that are very similar to each other, actually remains true. They are very similar in driving distance. Uh, they are in the top 38 of this field in driving distance, and they are you know, close to 50 years old. What, how old is Patty? Patty's 49. So Patrick Harrington, 49 years old. Phil, 50. Like I said, they're very close to each other. So you know, going that long game... Worked out for them for this tournament. Uh, maybe it's something we should have just, you know, kept our eye on. Uh, let's see. What else do I want to talk about? Is there anything that we need to, to cover? Um, did we have anybody inside? So all of, you know, I forgot to do this in, in last week's review video, but I usually look at the game and see if they were highlighted. That means they were in a good group. Actually, the number, the colors over here, if if there are any highlighted colors, that means they were in a good group. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight golfers that were in good groups that uh, we could have chosen from. And we highlighted 30 total. So eight out of 30 finished inside the top 10. That was pretty good. Let's see, did we, it was five times three, 15, 15. Yeah, we, we highlighted 30. Um. So that's that's a really good number to choose from. I don't know if we have any golfers that were in the same group together. It doesn't look like it. No. I'm not seeing any of the numbers here that are the same. So I don't think there was a group you wanted to pair together. I And I I advocate not doing that. It's just if they are in a group that you know, has all three guys better than scoring average or better than field average for either scoring average or DK average. I say, hey, you know, choose a golfer from this group. But yeah, none paired up. So there isn't really anything. I'll say this, Patty Harrington and Phil Mickelson. Dang it. Uh, I didn't have it highlighted, but they were in the same group. Isn't that something? I guess that just goes to show that, yeah, it doesn't, you don't really have to have good score. Okay. You don't really don't have to have better than field average and be uh, paired up together and do well. Man, 800 to one and 280 to one. That's nuts. Think of his top five or even top 10 odds that you could have gotten him at. Could've got, you could have gotten some good money. Uh, Patty Harrington hit for me last week, I believe. Like he popped up in, in lineups that I wanted. I, I know this because he was in my league lineup because I, I randomize how I put all my lineups together. And I know that's kind of silly for some some contests, but yeah, Patty Harrington was in the uh, in that league lineup. So he, yeah, he hit for me, or he popped up for me for a couple lineups. He's obviously um, doing something. He ended up being 131 in my rank this week. I did update my scoring just a little bit. And I think a lot of it had to do with grass stats because I don't think Patty was that good. Yeah, he was not good on Pete Dye. So this is what, what probably presented, you know, troubles for him here. Uh, same with his tournament history. So obviously he must have been good at the Byron Nelson versus here. Um, yeah. But I think that's all I have for you. For me, going forward, I mean, like, the bucket system, like I said, 
everything was highlighted green that was successful. I have no issues with the bucket system. It's the, the, the problem, the challenge comes with figuring out how to utilize that and building proper lineups. The optimizer's close. Uh, I absolutely enjoy the ability to have those conditionals that I go over because, I mean, if you didn't already know this, what I would do would be uh, going from like this page here and saying, okay, I want, you know, let's look at the buckets that I, I chose from. So, you know, this is how I do it. I, I'd look here and of the, what was it? 24 golfers that were in this bucket, how much did I want of one guy? So I'd break this up into percentages. I, I would try to figure out what's the max I can have in one lineup. And basically I would go by salary and say, okay, I'm going to start my lineups this way with those three golfers and bring them over here and put them right there. Uh oh, did it wrong. So I start like that. And then if that bucket says, oh, we can play additional ones. So if we're looking at tournament history ones, we want at least three. So, okay, so I'm looking. We want at least three of these guys. Well, here are all my top guys. And maybe I even do something like this. Well, from there, I'm going to select, you know, two more golfers within these price ranges and say, maybe I do something like this to put right next to them. But this is what I would do. I would just go, okay, Rory. Yep, I want a Rory lineup and I want Rory together with Hovland. So I put Hovland together. And I see that the colors here mean their last year, their last year buckets are fours. I don't want any more fours. So then I'm like, okay, how about we put Sam Burns together with them? And there we go. We got those covered. And I'll look at their buckets and try to figure it out. You see how tedious this would be? I'm glad the optimizer, if I put the conditionals in, to set and say, I want this much, it works for me. It works well. One thing that I failed to realize is I put in, you know, for 7K golfers, um, here's actually something that I, I, I'm not sure. I put in two. And in the optimal lineup, there was zero. The realistic optimal lineup had one, I think. No, the realistic lineup had zero. Zero seven Ks. The optimal lineup had one, Paul Casey, but we weren't getting there at forty six thousand three hundred. Um, and the um, the GPP winning lineup had zero seven K golfers in it as well. So me having two as my, and I will tell you right now, I did have two as my uh, locked in number. So I was always putting two 7K golfers in my lineup. I wasn't winning the optimal lineup that way. Uh, and the one thing that I was thinking of, it must have been because of here. So if we look at our salary buckets, the 7K range was your number one bucket. Sure, we had how many finish inside the top 10? Let's see here. Uh, Paul, okay, hold on. Yeah, let's open this up. So, I mean, we had Shane Lowry, there's one. Paul Casey, there's two. Abe Answers, 79. Ricky Fowler, seven. So, we actually had four. So, it worked out. Those guys were in the uh, the optimal lineup, or not the optimal, inside the top 10. So, it actually works out. Um, th okay, so here's the issue. So, those end up working out. Let me look here. Um, we need these three no matter what. An eight, a nine, and a six. Can I put in... So Paul Casey, sure. That works for me. Should we put in Abe Answer? There's another 7K. So now I have 9,000 I can work with. We'll go with Will. That's 48,600. How about Morikawa? That's 49,600. Okay, so that works. Do these guys equal more than the GPP winning lineup? 506, yeah, it beats the GPP. So I could have created a lineup using two 7K golfers. So I guess that gives me a little bit peace of mind knowing that I can win a GPP 
with that type of uh, lineup, but it's very concentrated and it's very specific. Um, the summary says minimum three, but our projected was three. You know I minus that into this number, and if it's one or more, then I make it a lock. When it's three, it's kind of weird. You know, like, I don't know how to take that. I, I, I think this just gets knocked down to two, that we should at least play two. And therefore, I'm I'm okay with that. But obviously, the optimal lineup didn't have it. Um, so now I'm kind of back to I'm stuck back to okay. Do we do we really put that much investment in it? I mean, we did. We could take down the GPP doing it that way. Um, I don't know. That's I kind of want to know what your thoughts are when you see this minimum three in the projected three. Are you thinking to yourself to play three? Or do you think there needs to be a threshold that, okay, this number isn't like five. And if I minus three into five, then I know I need to play at least two. You know, that's kind of how my logic works with these minimum buckets, especially with projected. Three is such a large number. It's very difficult for me to think we need to get to three. But obviously you've heard my strategy before, minus this number into your projected, and that's your you know, your absolute number you want. Well, if we do that here, we get zero. And the optimal lineup ended up having zero 7K golfers in it. So it, it works out that way. I don't know. I, I am interested to know what you guys think. Uh, but those are those are my, cl my closing thoughts. I'm not going to make this video any longer than it is. Uh, it's a review video. I don't know how many of you guys are you watching this, but at an hour long, I could see some of you kind of rolling your eyes and being like, ugh, I don't want to watch this. So anyways... We will figure this out. It is, it's a formula. It's a puzzle in my mind. Um, we have 150, you know, what would you call them? Variables that we have to somehow put together to make the most optimal equation, formula, whatever you want to call it. I truly believe it's through the bucket system. Uh, it, I don't know if it really needs any refinement. It's just figuring out how to put golfers in those buckets together to make that optimal optimal lineup. So we'll figure it out. But until then, thank you guys for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the preview for the next tournament. I already forgot what it is, but I'll see you then. All right, bye.